Money and the Meaning of Life, Abridged, by Jacob Needleman, read by Vincent Bagnall. Introduction. I once overheard the following advice. If you want to take the true measure of someone, observe how he handles sex, time, and money. The target of this advice was a woman who had met an oriental spiritual teacher and was ready to drop everything in order to follow him. As for the speaker, he was himself a teacher of considerable power, but a Westerner accustomed to moving in the rough-and-tumble world of business and government. Over the years that I had known this man, I had been deeply affected by his ability to guide others along the path of self-knowledge. But there was something essential about him that always eluded me, a capacity that set him apart from many other teachers and guides that I have met over the years. The moment he mentioned the word money in the context of spiritual growth, this feeling about him was again evoked in me. I began to grasp that part of his uniqueness was an ability to confront aspects of human life that devour or confuse most people in search of the meaning of living. Sex, time, and money. We know that the first of these is a force we all must struggle with, no matter who we are or what our aim in life may be. The teachings of every spiritual tradition and the writings of all serious thinkers offer insights of one sort or another about the question of sex. As for time, one may find at least theoretical treatments of this mystery in the scriptures, myths, and art of all ages, as well as in the writings of the philosophers. But one looks in vain for sustained guidance about money in the great teachings of the past or the books of the wise. It may even seem strange to mention it in the same breath with the other two issues. Yet the problem of money dogs our steps throughout the whole of our lives, exerting a pressure that in its way is as powerful and insistent as any other problem of human existence, and it haunts the spiritual search as well. Usually, our concerns about money reduce themselves to getting or managing it, and there are countless books about that aspect of the money question, but it is almost impossible to find serious and useful thought about the relationship between the quest for money and the quest for meaning. What is the role of money in the search for consciousness, in the pursuit of that transformation of the self spoken of by the great teachers and philosophers of all epochs and cultures? The aim of this book is to open this question and to offer material for the task of answering it for oneself. Why has this question never been squarely addressed before? Surely it is because in no other culture or civilization that we know of has money been such a pervasive and decisive influence? In the world we now live in, money enters into everything human beings do, into every aspect and pocket of life. This is something new. I do not mean to say that our culture is necessarily more um, materialistic than those that have preceded it. I am saying only that money, that extraordinary device whose origins we shall soon discuss, now plays an unprecedentedly powerful role in our inner and outer lives, and that any serious search for self-knowledge and self-development requires that we study the meaning that money actually has for us. Part 1. The Affluent Society and the Impoverished Soul Chapter 1. The Richest and Most Powerful Nation on Earth what really makes our country so wealthy? I can remember the first time the question occurred to me. I was only 12 years old, long before I had even heard of the science of economics. It was just after World War II. In newspapers and magazines and in the schoolroom, I was constantly hearing the United States referred to as the richest and most powerful nation on earth. Sometimes the phrase was, the richest and most powerful nation in history. I could well understand that we were the most powerful. Our military might, including the atomic bomb, was immense and invincible. But what did it mean that we were rich? How is a whole nation called 
rich. I was not rich. My family was not rich. Quite the contrary. We barely had enough money for the necessities of life. Nor were most of the people I knew rich, nor even comfortable. I knew that my schoolmate, Paul Meyer, who lived in a big house at the corner of our block, was rich. The latest evidence being his new Schwinn bicycle. Whatever I wanted, Paul Meyer had. That's what being rich meant. You could get whatever you wanted. And that is what money always meant to me and to everyone else I knew. But when I was quite a bit younger, eight years old maybe, I visited Paul Meyer's house for the first time. We went down to his large playroom in the basement. My eyes nearly leaped out of my head when I saw what he had there. Every toy I had ever dreamed of having, and many I had never even heard of before, were neatly arrayed on wide shelves all around the room. Not one of them was broken, and that fact startled me as much as the sheer quantity and variety of toys. Every toy of mine sooner or later broke or wore out, if only because I had to extract all the joy and meaning I could from it before finding the energy to beg, really beg, my parents to buy me a new one. Subconsciously, I must have felt that Paul never really knew the intensity of that kind of desire. When I saw his set of electric trains, I gasped and trembled. Half the floor was covered with gleaming silver tracks, crossing and looping beyond all comprehension, passing by exquisitely realistic switching and loading stations, bridges and signal poles with tiny lights flashing, and through a long mountain tunnel that had an actual miniature village with little houses and streets nestled on the slope. As for the trains themselves, well, when I saw them, I nearly exploded. They seemed a hundred times bigger than any toy trains I had ever seen. They were exact in every detail. I thought with shame of the miserable, tiny little set of trains that I owned. I had to squint to see them as real. But these trains of Paul Myers, and especially the heavy locomotive with moving wheels and great rods and countless spinning interlocking parts, were more real than reality itself. Paul pressed the handle on the big switch box. And the trains, there were two of them, started moving. I was beside myself with excitement, but Paul, I could not understand his lassitude. He did not even watch them as they flew around the tracks, stopping and starting with magical synchronization. Instead of looking at them, he looked at me. With a weak, pathetic smile. Here I was in Wonderland, and there before me, was this weak, sad little prince. I could not digest the contradiction. When I returned home, I ran to get my own cheap trains and set the teeny locomotive on a small circle of tracks. Something had long ago broken in the rusting switch box, so I clumsily pushed the locomotive around the tracks. I remember experiencing two contradictory feelings. On the one hand, a devouring envy of Paul Meyer, and at the same moment, a sensation of emptiness that made my face feel exactly like the weak, sad face I had just seen when I was with him, and which gave me the first taste of what I much later recognized as the feeling of compassion. For that brief moment, I knew from inside what Paul Meyer felt about his trains, and all his other toys. I'm not exaggerating when I say that this experience has stayed just below the surface of my consciousness during all the years that have followed, like a fragment of uranium irradiating my perceptions about money and wealth. In the household where I grew up, the most intense and violent emotions centered around money, the lack of it, the need for it, the desperate difficulty of having enough of it, and the fear of what would become of us without it. 
Money was power, reality, happiness. Money was a reality stronger than anything else. And the gods of money had no compassion. They were hard, unyielding, hostile. They broke my father's spirit again and again, and through his violent despair and anxiety, they continuously broke my own spirit. Yet, there was this Paul Meyer. What is an affluent society? What I'm trying to say is that we're all more alike than we may think. As a child, you may have had very different experiences with money, but we have all grown up in a wealthy country. And it was only much later in my life that I began to understand what this means. It means, at least in part, that ours is a society that has given material wealth first priority in our common life. As I studied the history of different cultures, I began to realize what was for me an astonishing fact. Not every civilization has wanted what ours has wanted. When I first glimpsed this fact about the history of human civilization, I was already far along in my career as a college professor, yet I experienced the same kind of shock that I experienced in Paul Meyer's playroom when I was eight years old. Here was a child who had everything I could ever dreamt of having, but it was not what he wanted. A new definition of affluence. Similarly, there had once existed civilizations, whole worlds, which had not wanted what we in our world have called wealth. But this must not be misunderstood or taken naively. Certainly, mankind has always needed and craved material things. Certainly, mankind has always needed and craved material things, and certainly human beings have always suffered from greed. But not every culture or civilization has measured itself principally by the standard of comfort and safety in the material world. We live, then, in a wealthy country, what nowadays has been called an affluent society. This means not only that we have much material wealth, but that we want this wealth more than we want anything else. This ordering of priorities has brought our civilization to the brink of ruin. We know we must find a way out, a way back to values and priorities that represent the real, whole nature of man. But all the ways that were once intended to help us find our authentic well-being and our authentic responsibility are themselves deeply stained by the money question. Religion, education, the pursuit of scientific knowledge, medicine, government, as well as most of our day-to-day -day relationships have all been surrounded and captured by our compulsion for material wealth and especially our fascination with the instrument we have invented in order to facilitate the acquisition and distribution of wealth, namely money. In search for a new attitude, what to do? How can we find a place to stand that is free from the influence of money so as to think impartially about it and then plot our course according to deeper values? We are like people adrift in a churning sea, desperately in need of finding even a tiny piece of stable, dry land upon which to take our bearings. Before we can solve the problem of our relationship to money, we must first understand it. And before we can understand it, we must study it. And this requires that we adopt a certain attitude toward the whole range of our problems with money. This new attitude is not easy to define or attain. We must not escape too far into abstractions, into philosophical outer space, completely free from the pulls and bites of the money problem. Because it is precisely the seductions and anxieties of money that we need to have in view. On the other hand, if we stay too close to the problem, it will influence our perceptions in ways that will make impartiality impossible. We will start trying to solve the problem before we have really understood it and seen it as a whole. A great part of all mankind's suffering comes from this tendency in all of us. We need to orbit 
the money problem. Much as a spacecraft orbits the Earth at a distance precisely between the gravitational pull of Earth and the freedom of outer space, this freedom, as we now know, is actually the sum total of the influences of distant worlds, suns, stars, galaxies. We need to stay just within the gravitational pull of the money problem and, with a clearer view of the stars, the great metaphysical teachings of the ages, circle our Earth with our eyes wide open and our observational instruments finely tuned. Chapter 2, The New Poverty A number of years ago, I began to notice the same complaint coming from almost everyone I knew. People would say something like, well, I'm going through a very bad time just now. Or they would say of someone else, this is a, a rough period for her. But I soon realized that these rough periods were occurring with greater frequency. They had become a permanent feature of people's lives. Yet my friends and acquaintances continued to speak as though they were only passing through something and would soon break into calmer waters. We're coming on to the holidays, one would say. It's a very bad time for people. Or, you know how August is. Everything goes to hell. Or, spring is always a tough time. I began to be very interested in this phenomenon. These are all talented, mature people. Many are professionals, physicians, executives, editors, scientists, engineers, school teachers, artists... Many live in beautiful homes and have fine cars or even boats. These are people who seem to have it made. Almost all these people admitted to being better off than they had ever been before, earning more money, living in better homes, having better cars, nicer clothes. Yet almost without exception, they were all in a difficult period. It was only after a long time and a great many such observations that the question of the wealth of our society came together in my mind with the fact of the increasing unhappiness of its people. A huge contradiction loomed in front of me. It was obvious that in some deep, essential sense we were not wealthy at all, but actually quite poor. We were all more or less like Paul Meyer. What does it feel like to be poor? What is the psychological suffering usually associated with poverty? Well, for myself, I have always pictured poverty as associated with fear and anxiety about the future. Fear of abandonment, fear of physical danger, and fear of loneliness. I see the poor as trapped, tense, cunning, harsh. I see them bored, empty of hope or consumed by absurd fantasies, or drugging themselves with some poison that destroys their bodies while offering only the relief of temporary oblivion. I see them living and dying like animals. Their lives are the very image of hell. The apparent object of one's desire serves only to intensify the desire itself. More recently and more interestingly, the word addiction has been used to describe this pervasive psychological suffering. Exactly as one may become addicted to a narcotic like opium or heroin, so we each have our addictive cravings for sex, perhaps or recognition or food or clothes or victory or explanations or any of the countless other things or experiences that form the object of what we call our emotions. We need to understand that when the great thinkers of the past warn us about the evils of our desires, they are speaking of this, they are speaking of addiction. No great teacher, neither Christ nor Moses nor Socrates, ever condemned desire as such. No, what they have tried to show us is that we allow the desires to define our sense of identity. We fuel these desires with a certain precious psychic energy that is meant to serve a much higher function in our lives. Fueled by this higher psychic energy, desires become cravings, addictions, and there's no better representation of this state of affairs than the image of unquenchable fire. 
In the first part of Dante's Divine Comedy, the author descends into hell and begins by feeling pity for the men and women he sees there, writhing in filth and pain. But his guide, the great poet Virgil, admonishes him. Do not feel pity, Virgil tells him. They are getting exactly what they want. Hell is the state in which we are barred from receiving what we truly need because of the value we give to what we merely want. It is a condition of ultimate deprivation, that is, poverty. In his vastly influential work, The Affluent Society, John Kenneth Galbraith characterizes the present economic structure of American society as based not only on the satisfaction of desire, but on the creation of desire. This aspect of our economic order is one of the chief factors that distinguishes it from the economies of almost all other countries in history. In the following passage from the Affluent Society, Galbraith sums up his analysis of the dynamics of the production of consumer goods in our society. With very minor changes, it could pass for a traditional Buddhist description of hell. One cannot defend production as satisfying wants if that production creates the wants. Were it so that a man on arising each morning was assailed by demons which instilled in him a passion sometimes for silk shirts, sometimes for kitchenware, sometimes for chamber pots, and sometimes for orange squash, there would be every reason to applaud the effort to find the goods, however odd, that quenched this flame. But should it be that his passion was the result of his first having cultivated the demons, and should it also be that his great effort to allay it stirred the demons to even greater and greater effort, there would be question as to how rational was his solution. Unless restrained by conventional attitudes, he might wonder if the solution lay more with goods or fewer demons. So it is that if production creates the want it seeks to satisfy, or if the wants emerge pari passu with the production, then the urgency of the wants can no longer be used to defend the urgency of the production. Production only fills a void that it has itself created. The Destruction of Time the Buddhist symbolism of hell has much to teach us about our life in the affluent society. In Buddhism, the world just beneath the human level is occupied by animals. In this symbolism, animals are understood as beings for whom the getting of food so completely dominates their daily lives that they have no free time to pursue any other aim. Moreover, the animal mind, with all its perception and feeling, is almost entirely in the service of this pursuit. The animal does not and cannot contemplate or ponder or even see anything that does not relate to its desire for food. In addition, the animals cannot live except by preying on each other. Now, who can deny that in this sense we live like animals? Do we not everywhere hear the same cry? I have no time. I'm so busy. I have too much to do. Everywhere people are straining to set aside time for things that are felt to be humanly important, being with loved ones, enjoying nature, studying ideas, or engaging in some creative activity. And more and more it is becoming a losing battle. Why has time disappeared in our culture? How is it that after decades of inventions and new technologies devoted to saving time and labor, 
the result is that there's no time left? We are a time-poor society. We are temporarily impoverished. And there is no issue, no aspect of human life that exceeds this in importance. The destruction of time is literally the destruction of life. Leisure, holidays, retirement, recreation. Anyone who has tried to turn these activities in the hope of recovering his or her own human sense of time knows how disappointing they have become, how nearly impossible it now is to have real, full, and valid time. We rarely feel that our time is our own. We rarely sense that we are consciously alive. Now and here, free from compulsive worry about the past and the future, free fully to experience our lives. The coin of time has been degraded and cheapened to the point of vanishing. In a very real sense, in a terrifyingly real sense, our lives have been growing shorter and shorter. Even as medical science finds even more ingenious ways of prolonging our biological or animal time, if we are going to find a new approach to the money question, it will have to enable us to bring time back into our lives. As with time, so with space. Many are the images of hell that show it to be suffocatingly crowded. No freedom of movement is possible there. The denizens of hell cannot step away from the endlessly repetitive pursuit of what they crave. There is no perspective in hell, no distance from oneself. This absence of personal space is the visual symbol of what the wisdom teachings of all ages have referred to as the condition of self-identification with one's desires and fears. In the East, this is called attachment. In the West, it has been called simply capture. In all cultures, we find images of hell in which the devil or devils are pictured as eating human beings. Legends and fairy tales are full of stories in which monsters swallow and devour hapless men and women. This, too, is the condition known by the fathers of the early church as capture. A day in the life of Donald Trump. At this point, I cannot resist citing the portrait of his daily life offered by Daily Trump in his book, The Art of the Deal. It has been haunting me ever since I read it. I wake up most mornings very early, writes Mr. Trump, and spend the first hour or so of each day reading the morning newspapers. I usually arrive at my office by nine and I get on the phone. There's rarely a day with fewer than 50 calls, and often it runs to over 100. In between, I have at least a dozen meetings. The majority occur on the spur of the moment, and few of them last longer than 15 minutes. I rarely stop for lunch. I leave my office by 6.30, but I frequently make calls from home until midnight. And all weekend long. It never stops, Mr. Trump continues, and I wouldn't have it any other way. He then presents an hour-by-hour picture of his week, which consists entirely of meetings and telephone calls involving some of the most influential businessmen. I wake up most mornings very early, writes Mr. Trump, and spend the first hour or so of each day reading the morning newspapers. I usually arrive at my office by nine. I get on the phone. There's rarely a day with fewer than 50 calls, and often it runs to over 100. In between, I have at least a dozen meetings. The majority uh, occur on the spur of the moment. A few of them last longer than 15 minutes. I rarely stop for lunch. I leave my office by 6.30, but I frequently make calls from home until midnight and all weekend long. It never stops, Mr. Trump continues. And I wouldn't have it any other way. He then presents an hour-by-hour picture of his week, which consists entirely of meetings and telephone calls involving some of the most influential businessmen, the most famous or adored celebrities, the most highly placed government officials in America and Europe. It includes negotiations involving hundreds of, of millions of dollars, the buying and selling of giant companies and huge properties. I do it for the money, he writes. I've got enough, much more than I'll ever need. I do it to do it. Deals are my art form. Other people paint beautifully on canvas or write wonderful poetry. I like making deals, preferably big deals. So I get my kicks. My attention span is short, 
writes Trump in his most recent book. Instead of being content with everything's going fine, I start getting impatient and irritable. So I look for more and more deals to do. On a day in which I've got several good ones in the works and the phone calls and faxes are going back and forth and the tension is palpable, well, at those times I feel the way other people do when they're on vacation. Why do I cite these passages? Why have they haunted me? Because there is a Donald Trump inside of me. And probably inside of you, too. On my own small scale, I too like to be occupied with important people, important situations, serious problems. I too like challenges of a certain kind, to be sure. There are other kinds of challenges which terrify me, and perhaps Donald Trump too. I am haunted by this image of the pleasure, the joy of being busy, of being busy with important things. I am haunted and disturbed by the part of myself that envies Donald Trump. How good it would be to live like that, dealing with big forces in the game of life and winning most of the time. But in any case, always being involved in something major and being the central person, the one who makes the difference. How did you get inside me, Trump? I don't remember letting you in. Do I really like having no time, or to put it better, do I really prefer so many things, so much outer doing to living consciously within myself in the present moment? What I am asking is this. Do I, do you, need to make that telephone call just now? Do I need to buy that car or suit or new VCR or that extraordinary carpet? Do you need to accept that invitation to dinner? Do I need to write that book, receive that honor, take that trip? Do you need now to file those papers, dictate that report? Do you need to be busy, that is swallowed by your own activity? What is it that makes all of us end each day with the sense that we have not lived our time, but have been lived? used by what we do? Even those of us who are not so assailed by outer activities are part of the same tragedy. Even when we are not busy, we are often driven by envy of those who are busy. We continually look for ways to become busy, that is, to be devoured by some outer activity. We dread the prospect of not having enough to do, and as for the rest of us, who are neither immersed in outer activities nor yearning for them, our time is swallowed by dreams and fantasies or by the thousand little impulses, emotions, and thoughts that continually arise within us. In some, time disappears into outer action or inner impulses, into doings, cravings, or dreamings. But human time is conscious time. And this has been lost, destroyed. In its place, there is now animal time, doing, moving about, preying on others, eating, building, killing, etc. Plant time, dreaming, languishing, imagining, or mineral, that is mechanical time, the time of devices such as clocks and computers. What we call logical thinking is often just an an internal version of these lifeless machines. Implicitly, we even take pride in the mechanicity of our thinking when forgetting the metaphorical origin of the usage. We refer to a computer's intelligence. This is mental time, mineral in its rigidity and sterility. We lay this logical cement over organic life out there and in ourselves, carried to its extreme. This becomes the mindset that measures the whole of human life solely by the bottom line. The realm of diminishing being. These observations bring us to what is perhaps the most terrifying of all the images of hell to be found in the ancient teachings. In the Old Testament, the lower world is called 
Shoal. Here there are no images of raging fire, no cacophonous sounds, no sulfurous fumes. Sheol is simply and solely the place of shadows, dark, weak existence, continually fading, ever paler life. Sheol is the realm of diminishing being. This is what is meant by darkness, when in Deuteronomy 33, God says to man, I have placed before thee life and death, darkness, therefore choose life. Sheol is the condition of human life proceeding with ever-diminishing human presence. It is the movement toward absence, the movement away from God. For let us carefully note that one of the central definitions of God that is given in the Old Testament is conscious presence. Moses asks God, What shall I say to the people of Israel? Whom shall I say has sent me with these commandments? The answer he receives, as mysterious today as it has ever been, Say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Exodus 3.14 Sheol, the lower world, or hell of the ancient Hebrews, is the condition of ever-increasing distance from I am, from one's own conscious presence in the midst of life. It is this state of the human psyche that is, for us, the most relevant definition of hell. Beyond all social criticism of our era and beyond all the progress and accomplishments we could name, the conditions of our culture more and more favor the diminishing of our being. Less and less is it necessary in this affluent society to be consciously present in order to accomplish the tasks that we are obliged to perform. The technologies, the inventions, the accomplishments we prize, all of them, almost without exception, are prized because they allow us to live and function more and more automatically without conscious presence, without I am. I take the happy life of Donald Trump as a symbol of this state of affairs. I should, of course, add that I have never met Mr. Trump personally. For all I know, he too wakes up in the middle of the night asking himself what he is doing and why. Possibly he, like us, sometimes sees that he's not the hero of his life, but in fact he's being lived by his life, rather than living it himself. Even though he writes as though he is consciously making great decisions and masterfully dealing with the vicissitudes of life, I do not for a moment take his book seriously in that respect, and perhaps he doesn't either. But as a symbol of one of the key aspects of our modern mythology, Mr. Trump serves very well. The ancient Greeks had a view of hell similar to that of the Hebrews, the land of shadows, ruled by the Lord Hades. Homer tells us what the great and cunning explorer, risk-taker, and trouble-seeker Odysseus learned when he was visited by the denizens of this realm, this underground world of the dead whose heads are filled with darkness as they wander forever among the silent fields of asphodels, who can never, the myth tells us, return to sweet daylight because they have drunk of the waters of the river Lethe forgetfulness. They cannot remember the way they were brought to this dark realm and therefore can never find their way back to the land of the living. Among those who appear to Odysseus is none other than the greatest of the Greeks, the king and warrior Achilles. Most fortunate man that ever was or will be, Odysseus greets him, and he continues, For in the days when you were on earth, we, Argives, honored you, as though you were a god. And now, down here, you are a mighty prince among the dead. For you, Achilles, death has surely lost its sting. My lord, Odysseus, replies Achilles, spare me your presence, spare me your praise of death, put me on earth again, 
and I would rather be a slave in the house of some poor and landless man than king of all these dead men. When one begins to appreciate the significance of the fact that we are simply not consciously present in our lives, the reason we are unable to find practical spiritual wisdom that can help us understand money is that we no longer can discern the teaching about presence in the doctrines and philosophies that have survived the passing of centuries. Once we reintroduce this notion into our understanding of life, there can appear a sort of aqueduct carrying good, fresh water from the great minds of the past into the infernal wasteland of our contemporary existence. We have all had intimations of the idea of hell as life lived without consciousness of self. I remember when I first heard about the Christian's idea of hell, that popular version of the idea that takes it literally, horned devils and pitchforks. I felt strangely relieved when I started thinking about it. As a small child, my idea of death had come strictly from seeing animals killed and from seeing my grandparents lying embalmed in their coffins. I thought of death as pure disappearance, vanishing. And when I tried to grasp the possibility of my own death, I became terrified beyond measure. I could not understand, I could not picture, I could not in any way accept that I, me, here, could ever not exist. And so, when as a child I heard about the souls of bad people spending eternity in a very hot place being jabbed by pitchforks, I said to myself something like, that is not very pleasant to contemplate. I certainly do not want to be stuck and burned forever. But, however bad that might be, at least I would go on existing. What a blessed thought. But in my guts, I still feared that the other notion of what happens at death was the true one and it continued to torment me. It was only long after I became an adult that something new entered into this fear. I began to have moments, in every other respect, moments of balance and deep moral feeling, when I feared that I had already disappeared, vanished, Moments when I understood what those earliest perceptions of death really were telling me. Taking money seriously. The point I wish to make in this book is that money needs first to be understood before we allow ourselves any moral stance at all. Surely a huge proportion of human unhappiness in all aspects of our lives comes from trying to know what we ought to do before we see clearly the forces that are at play. Most so-called moral dilemmas simply dissolve when one gathers all the knowledge that is actually available. We waste an immense amount of our precious energy trying to make decisions before we really have to or are able to. Once we see something clearly, the question of morality more or less takes care of itself. Authentic morality is the child of understanding. It may seem paradoxical, but what I'm saying is that our lives have become a hell, not because money is too important to us, but because in a certain sense, it is not important enough. Money is energy. One of the commonest views of money today is that it is a form of energy. Certainly, money is the main moving force of human life at the present stage of civilization. Our relationships to nature, to health and illness, to education, to art, to social justice are all increasingly permeated by the money factor. It is not a question of regretting this fact, it is solely a question of understanding it. We live in the same world metaphysically, cosmically speaking, as did Pythagoras, Gautama, Buddha, St. Augustine, or Moses. The same forces are at play on this plane of being called Earth, human life, on Earth. The Greeks gave the names of gods to these forces, Apollo, Aphrodite, Kronos, Today, such forces are given names derived from modern psychology or science, for example, entropy, libido, homeostasis, which, however, convey only a pale reflection of their real power in human life and the cosmic scheme. And in our time, the forces that define human life on Earth manifest themselves through money. In other times and in other cultures, 
Money has not played this role, but there has always been the same play of forces. What has changed is the medium through which these forces have flowed. In some cultures, the currency, that is to say the medium through which the main energies of human life has passed, has been land or livestock or human slaves or a natural substance such as water or salt or iron or weapons or even ideas in symbolic forms such as beauty or honor. Walk into any museum, study any good book of history, look at any ancient document, and you will see that mankind has always put its main energy into one or another kind of thing, substance or form. We do not create the art of the Renaissance or medieval Europe. We do not worship the state as did ancient Rome. We do not build as did the Egyptians. But neither the Egyptians nor the medieval Europeans nor the peoples of the Renaissance nor, for that matter, the cultures of ancient China, Greece or Persia, nor the inhabitants of the North American continent before the white man, none of these created the immense global mechanism of finance whose penetration into every aspect of human life has been the chief feature of our contemporary culture. In other times and places, not everyone has wanted money above all else. People have desired salvation, beauty, power, strength, pleasure, propriety, explanations, food, adventure, conquest, comfort. But now and here, money, not necessarily even the things money can buy, but money is what everyone wants. The outward expenditure of mankind's energy now takes place in and through money. For anyone who wishes to understand the meaning of his own individual life on earth, it is imperative that one understand this movement of energy. Therefore, if one wishes to understand life, one must understand money in this present phase of history and civilization. This outward movement of energy by itself has never been enough to bring ultimate meaning to human existence. Throughout all times and places, mankind has had to work to survive, to give out the energy necessary to fulfill the demands of biological and social existence on Earth. But at the same time, he has been drawn to seek contact with something quite different. At all times, man has had to struggle not to be swallowed by the outer demands of life, not to disappear into these demands, needs, and desires which are a legitimate part of his nature, but only a part. All the great teachers of human history have brought ideas, methods, and symbols designed to help mankind in this struggle. At the same time, the outward expenditure of energy constitutes an inescapable and essential aspect of our being. To turn away from that outward movement is to lose the authentic possibility of our life and essence as human beings. He who condemns this outward movement does not understand the human condition, the human structure, and the human possibility. And so the perennial question of humanity, the only question worth devoting one's life to is, how are we, how am I, to live fully in the world of birth and death, the world of organic life on earth, the world of society, responsibility, making and doing, while at the same time fulfilling the immensely higher and greater possibility that is offered to us as human beings. The thesis of the book is that the chief representative of life on earth, the world of birth and death, the world we are born to but not necessarily destined to die in, that chief representation is now money. Our task, then, is to search for contact with something far greater than we can imagine while participating rightly and truly in the forces of life on Earth. Two worlds, two natures. The very essence of the idea of man that we find at the core of all the great teachings of all times and places is that we human beings are two-natured. I shall soon try to spell out more clearly some of the astonishing implications of this idea. For now, we may take from this idea the following direction. Human life has meaning only insofar as we consciously and intentionally occupy two worlds at the same time. One force alone can never bring meaning into human life. 
Meaning appears only in the place between the worlds, in the relationship of two worlds, two levels, two fundamental qualities of power and energy. Money is now, at this period of civilization, the chief representative of one of these fundamental worlds. That is its extraordinary, immense significance. We must understand it and respect it for that. This lower world of money is not evil. For us, as beings built to live consciously in two worlds, real evil consists solely of those factors in ourselves that prevent conscious awareness of both the inner and the outer world. It is not money itself which obstructs this awareness. The challenge of our lives is to face the money question without disappearing into it or running away from it. We must take money seriously. If we wish to live a human life, this can mean only that we participate humanly in all the forces of life, or to put it another way, that we allow all the forces of life to participate in ourselves, to be embraced by our consciousness. We enter hell only when our consciousness is devoured, when we are absorbed by the outward-directed energy that constitutes only part of our true nature. To be obsessed by money is certainly to be in hell, but there is another kind of hell, which we must also now acknowledge. We live in that hell when we refuse to participate in the realities of life, when dreams and fantasies, spiritual or otherwise, take the place of a real inner search. Let us now look at this other apartment in hell, idealism and the reality of money. It is October 1967. I'm walking in the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco. The summer of love has just made history. The Vietnam War is tearing out everyone's heart. Young people's minds are exploding and burning with drug-induced visions and paranoid terrors. Incense fills the air. Beautiful young men and women drift through the streets dressed like horis, gypsies, Indians, sannyasins, prostitutes, derelicts, criminals, players in a drama of world revolution and mystical ecstasy. The tremor of sexual risk and erotic abandon is everywhere, and in everything, secretly lending to all ideas and events a certain mixture of fury, courage, and impending exhaustion. Strange handmade objects, as bold as they are ugly, are everywhere. Oriental images, lush, brilliant posters, crystals, and excrement, and everywhere the aroma of marijuana. Brilliant neurochemical eyes gaze at uh, who knows what. Soft glances, young bodies without spines, dogs without leashes crowd the sidewalk. For some months now, I've been researching and writing about the Eastern religions now attracting so many of these young people. Was there a real spiritual revolution taking place in America? Were these teachers, masters, and gurus from Asia really bringing something authentic to our culture? And were these young men and women really searching for higher values? Or was the whole new religions phenomenon only the high notes of a long, desperate scream? Were these followers of the new religions the antenna of an America seeking to regain its soul, or only the raw, oozing skin of an unhealed wound called Vietnam? As a professor of philosophy and comparative religion, I had listened with great interest to people half my age speaking of spiritual experiences that I had only read about in the writings of the great saints and sages of India, Tibet, China, and Japan. My own personal acquaintance with the immense difficulties of the inner search made me very skeptical about the authenticity of the psychological descriptions I was hearing. Yet there was no doubting the sincerity of the need these young people felt for meaning and vision in their lives. There was no doubting that they had seen through the lies and hypocrisies of our society. They saw the materialism of America with a blazing clarity of fear, fear of dying in an ugly, selfish war against a tiny nation far, far away. Like an erupting volcano, their vision brought to America the light of a fire joined with a terrible heat and great dark clouds of vaporizing subterranean matter. I enter one of the shops on Haight Street, breathing in the sickly sweet fumes of frangipani incense and marijuana. In the corner of the store near the cash register, a pale, beautiful girl is playing gentle chords on a small harp. 
her face wrapped in happiness, her long blonde hair flowing down to the floor. Behind the glass display counters is a profusion of oriental jewelry, knickknacks, decorated boxes, scarves, copper urns, brass bowls, carved ivory and jade. The walls are covered with a wild melange, photographs and portraits of spiritual teachers, paintings of religious symbols, silk scarves, statues, masks from Africa, Indonesia, and Nepal. Now, at first glance, it seems to me that the merchandises in the display cases and the store owner's religious values are on the wall. Even so, I'm startled to see these faces decorating the walls of a business. There is the 19th century Hindu saint, Ramakrishna. Next to him, a photograph of the greatly revered 20th century master, Sri Ramana Maharshi. And there's a photo of another Indian teacher, Meher Baba. Over there, a famous portrait of the 6th century Zen master, Bodhidharma. Together with a photo of the renowned scholar, D.T. Suzuki. There, farther along, several photographs of Sufi saints. And there is Krishnamurti and a Russian icon of the face of Christ. There is Gurdjieff, and there are many others. There are great metal crucifixes, including a powerful Mexican carving of Christ wounded, bleeding, and dying. There are Jewish prayer shawls, Tibetan bells, and vajras, and countless other objects that I'd never seen anywhere, except in the solemn environment of churches or temples. Suddenly, I notice there's a price tag on the Russian icon, and then I'm seeing the price tags everywhere. Why had I not noticed them before? They are now also obvious. I muscle through the crowd to get a better look, and I am beginning to wonder why I'm so shocked. The icon is going for five hundred and ninety-five dollars. The photo of Ramana Marshi is twenty-two fifty. The prayer shawl is thirty-five dollars, and it is a beauty, fine, delicately knotted fringes, rich, deep, pure white silk. I want it badly. The following little drama then unreels. Taking out my checkbook, I ask the clerk, another pale girl, smiling with the same blurred ecstasy as the harpist to let me see the prayer shawl. Oh, she says in the gentlest, tiniest voice, we only take cash. Now, for some reason, the word cash, coming from this flower child, hits me in the gut as though it were an obscenity. I can feel my jaw thrusting forward, and I say loudly and stupidly, what do you mean you don't take checks? It's the store policy, she says, a little frightened, but not frightened enough for my liking. She puts the prayer shawl down on the counter. I shove it aside without even looking at it. And then I hear myself saying in an even louder voice, Do you know who I am? I'm Jacob Needleman. I'm a professor at San Francisco State University. As I'm spitting out this absurdity, my eyes fall upon the photograph that happens to be on the wall just behind her. Having just heard my mouth expressing the most pompously egotistical sounds I had ever consciously heard it utter, I now find myself being observed by none other than Guantama Buddha himself, whose teaching about the illusions of ego I had just that morning so carefully explained to my students at the university. The comedy continues. Let me speak to the owner, I demand. The sales girl disappears and returns accompanied by a man in his late twenties with unkempt hair, soft, watery eyes, a sickeningly loving smile, and a small photograph of a Hindu presumably his guru, hanging around his neck. I repeat my demands, adding something to the effect, thank God, I don't remember my exact words, not only am I a professor, but a professor of philosophy and religion, and give courses in the very people whose photographs are on the wall, as though that in itself entitled me to pay by check. Suddenly, the man with a sickening smile develops eyes hard as steel, and somehow, without his altering the smallest muscle in his lips, the loving smile is transformed into a sardonic grin. He picks up the prayer shawl for a fleeting moment. I actually imagine he is going to offer it to me as a gift. And while he is reverently folding it, he advises me to perform a sexual act upon myself. Back in the street, a team of Hare Krishnas in full regalia and painted faces march by, chanting their Hindu mantra. I am trembling with anger. But at what? Or whom? And as one of the Hare Krishnas asks me to buy some incense or something, I suddenly burst into a laughter. But again, at what? Or at whom? As I walk aimlessly around the Haight Ashbury, my mind is a blooming jungle of thoughts about the confusion of money and religion. My own confusion and that of the flower children and hippies around me. The encounter at the shop allowed an impression to come into me 
concerning the hard reality of money, the kind of impression I used to have as a child when my own dreams and hopes were sometimes dashed by the realities of money or by the money fears of my father. As I walked in the streets now, I tried to understand what I had experienced in the shop, or at least to name it properly. In that shop, I had seen the force of money in one of its most important manifestations. The shopkeeper had to be a businessman. He had to calculate rationally. He had to deal with the material facts of his business. He had no doubt had too much of. Yet he was also a spiritual seeker. Maybe he was a disciple of some sincere Hindu teacher. Maybe he had in his heart dreams of freedom from the ego, God realization, or maybe he blasted his head with dope every day. Who knew? But no matter how much spiritual love he sought or felt, he still had to deal with business facts. The spiritual seeker was a lousy businessman, but he was a businessman. His money personality operated with no conscious relationship to his spiritual personality. His spiritual ideals prevented him from facing the needs of his business with anything like a human intelligence or care. These ideals had no room in them for the realities of everyday living that operate in the sphere of money. And so these spiritual ideals would probably forever remain only ideals, never entering into the details of his life. Lost in his extravagant religious ideals, he could not allow himself to face the kind of dealing with people that is necessary in order to be a good businessman. And therefore only the most primitive self-serving reactions could appear in him in a situation that demanded the ordinary control of these reactions that any sensible businessman can and must exercise. He did not take money seriously enough. He did not give enough ordinary human attention to playing his role as a shopkeeper. But what about me? Hard as it was to do, I had to accept that I was just as confused about money as the shopkeeper. Replaying the whole farce in my mind, I swung between tears and laughter as I remembered the antics of my preposterous ego in that situation. I saw that somewhere in my mind I, too, cherished the assumption that spiritual things should never be touched by money considerations. I, too, was afflicted with a hypocritical fantasy that dealings with God exempted one from dealing realistically with a world of money. I did not feel the meaning of money. Oh, yes, I wanted money and craved money just as much as anyone else, and I feared money problems as much as anyone else. But I cannot say I felt the importance or significance of money in the conduct of life. So while I could speak and write about spiritual, philosophical, and metaphysical ideas, not one ounce of my intelligence or sensitivity ever reached its way to perceiving and understanding money. I did not understand at that time that money was one of the chief ways in which man's life manifests itself in our world. What a pathetic purity it is that prevents the better part of one's mind from attending to life with people and their needs, wants, and cares. What stood between these two parts of myself and screened one off from the other, so much so that in the face of the money problem, in this case a small purchase in a shop, only the lowliest manifestation of the ego animal could show itself? I and that shopkeeper, were we not two ego animals growling at each other? And these two ego animals... Didn't they each have great spiritual ideals in their minds somewhere, somewhere far off, screened, buffered from the parts of ourselves that dealt with our fellow man? To take money seriously, this means to tear down that screen. This does not mean that one confuses spiritual strivings with material needs. On the contrary, it is necessary to see the real and true difference between these two human pursuits. But it does mean that one gives to one's material needs the energy and intelligence that is required for satisfying them, while allowing space in oneself for the appearance and action of the striving for transcendent meaning. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. In my opinion, the entire problem of life in contemporary culture can be defined as the challenge to understand that saying of Jesus. It is not so simple. In fact, it is immensely difficult. It requires that we 
begin to understand what in ourselves belongs to the transcendent realm and what to the material realm. And then to give to each what is due to each. No more and no less. This is what it means to be human. Meaning can come from no other source than this. The encounter between a philosopher and a spiritual shopkeeper, absurd and farcical as it is, illustrates many of the confusions that operate on very broad and significant levels in all our lives. In such personal and apparently trivial events, the likes of which are experienced daily by all of us, we may see what really lies behind our attitudes toward money. And in so doing, we may hope to go beyond our usual reactions to what we call greed, heartlessness, hypocrisy, and immorality, both in everyday life and in business, religion, politics, education, medicine, in all aspects and institutions of our fragile civilization. God and Caesar. It may seem a long step from Donald Trump to an inept spiritual shopkeeper in the Haight-Ashbury, but they're not so far apart as it may appear. The first represents the attempt to find life's meaning in money. The other tries to make money out of the search for meaning. I know them both all too well. They live inside of me, and perhaps inside of most of us. They represent the confusion of two directions of life within us. This confusion prevents us from seeing the real difference between the search for God and the need to live normally in the material world. The difficulty of accepting the idea that man is a two-natured being and the challenge of living accordingly to that idea are not new. This has always been the challenge before mankind. It is possible to view the whole history of the human race as a drama in which this idea of the two natures is first given by Jesus, Lao Tzu, Moses, and all the spiritual geniuses of the world and then covered over or forgotten by whole peoples and cultures. That man has both a spiritual and a material side, that he is both good and evil, angel and devil, is of course the commonest of notions, but what precisely differentiates these two sides of human nature? And what attitude must we take toward them? And how can they be brought into relationship? Ought they even be brought into relationship? On these questions, there is great confusion and discord throughout the history of civilization. As with sex, so with money, the medieval church tolerated the necessary exchange of money for goods, but considered business or trade as such to be morally dangerous. The task of the church was to regulate the economic life of society so that the material needs of individuals did not become the cravings that pull one away from religious principles of behavior. For example, the laws against usury or excessive interest on loans were at their root meant to prevent exploitation of another's misfortune or need. In our capitalistic world, it is difficult for us to understand why religious traditions have always regarded the charging of interest with such strong disapproval. What we forgot is that prior to our era, an individual usually asked for a loan of money only when driven to it by hardship. To charge interest on such a loan was to seek to profit from my neighbor's hardship. It was a form of avarice. We must keep in mind how strongly the Christian church considered man's economic activity in terms of the essential interdependence of human beings. Economic activity was understood in the context of individuals providing what was needed for each other in the material realm. In its most general and deepest sense, this interdependence is implicit in the commandment to love one's neighbor. Ideally, all activity in the material and social realm must provide what is needed, or beneficial, for others, as well as for oneself. Thus, just as the pleasures of sex were justified only as an aspect of the duty of procreation, so material acquisition was justified only to the extent that it corresponded to the individual's authentic needs and those of the community, the unfinished self. Man is a being endowed with spirit that flows within a mortal, physical body. He lives in a physical world that is also suffused with spirit. This is his metaphysical destiny. His task is to live in direct relationship to both spirit and matter, and in so doing, 
forge within himself a new godlike consciousness known as the soul. And to this end, he must give both spirit and matter their proper due. Man, as Kierkegaard expressed it in the modern era, is meant to be a self, in medieval language a soul, a synthesis of time and eternity, the finite and the infinite. It is his task, his destiny, but he is not yet this destiny. Man is not yet a self. How to direct man to the infinite in himself without neglecting the finite? How to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's? It took all the intensity and watchfulness of the greatest of spiritual masters to maintain this dynamic balance within the confines of the Christian monastery. Under a Saint Benedict, for example, in the 6th century, the activity of the monk was carefully and creatively apportioned between meditative, mystical prayer, and physical activity, communal association. And this balance needed constantly to be reappraised and monitored by the leader of the monastery and by each monk within his own inner world. Temptation existed in both directions, and the writings of the fathers of the early church are witness to the great difficulty of this challenge, as well as the unfathomable rewards it brought. If this quest was difficult within the dynamically controlled conditions of the monastery, it was all but impossible outside the monastery in the vortex of everyday life. The ethics of the medieval church, the laws by which it sought to regulate European society, could not affect what could be affected within the more controlled conditions of the monastery, but it could provide a religious framework which allowed men and women the possibility of searching for contact with something greater than the social ego. Much of what we now label as mere dogma, such as the doctrine that man was created in the image of God and fell into sin, in fact served to regulate both the outer and the inner life of men and women so that these two realities, these two aspects of human nature, did not depart irretrievably far from each other so that the real difference between these two natures of man could, at least in theory, be appreciated. The outer life of man, his lower nature, his animal, his physical and social needs as a mortal being, were understood to be real, but secondary. The ethics of the church aimed to prevent man from giving too much of himself to that outer nature, but it also aimed to respect it and satisfy its legitimate needs. The Most Dangerous Illusion Throughout human history, this teaching has proved so elusive that it has had to be continually rediscovered and recreated in the midst of the distortions that inevitably degrade it. One of these distortions has been the out-and-out -out condemnation of the lower nature of man, his physical and material needs and desires. Another distortion that often accompanied the first has been to overemphasize the divinity in man to the point that the lower nature was neglected. In the first case, the result is that we term the puritanical attitude with the hypocrisy and hidden psychological repression that comes in its train. The second results in the establishment of monastic conditions that are actually an escape from life, from the human condition. In this case, the monastery becomes only a shelter from the very truths about oneself that one needs to face. The great founders of the monastic system never organized monastic life in this way. On the contrary, the monastery was to be a place where the individual could experience a more intense encounter with the two natures, an encounter that could lead to the reception within oneself of the transcendentally reconciling force called the Holy Spirit, or the grace, the gift of God. In this context, the material and economic needs of man were not considered evil. They were considered secondary. The tragic misunderstanding arises when that which is secondary gets taken as evil. It is a huge error. To give the lower nature its proper place in human life requires a fine and dynamic attention. To treat the lower nature as evil, on the contrary, invites a kind of violence toward an essential aspect of human nature. And this, in its turn, invites the reaction we have witnessed especially strongly in modern times, in which the unattended lower nature finally asserts itself like an unattended fire raging out of control. The masters of the Christian teaching understood this dynamic as operating both within and outside of the individual human being, both within the self and within the human community. 
the unattended legitimate needs and desires of a lower nature spread like wildfire or like tares, to use the language of the Gospels. What were called the deadly sins were often to be understood in this way. Lust was what became of the normal sexual need when it lost its relation to the higher spiritual nature of man. Avarice was what became of the normal material needs of man when they lost their relation to the spiritual nature of man. And this, in fine, is why trade and commerce, and especially dealing in money, were so suspect. The economic life of man had to be conducted in such a way that the individual could see it as secondary to the aim of opening to the higher, to God. Secondary, not evil. An individual needed to live the life of the family and the body for his own well-being while at the same time recognizing the dependence on the whole community and his obligation to serve the whole community as a step toward brotherly love. Under no circumstances was society to encourage man to feel self-sufficient, autonomous. This was the most dangerous of illusions, which would prevent his understanding his true nature as a divided, potentially exalted being whose true happiness depended on his receiving the spiritual force from above that could bind his two natures together and make of him a servant of God on this earth, in this creation. The amassing of material goods could not help but foster the illusion of self-sufficiency and with it the disease of self-blindness, the illusion of self-power, that hard, rigid, hellish nightmare that the fathers of the Christian tradition called pride. Pride is the Self-imagining, it does not need to breathe the air of God. Pride is the illusion of false unity and power that prevents man from attaining authentic unity and power. The material world, like the lower nature, is not evil, but taken apart from its relation to the spiritual, it draws men away from their true possible glory and duty. Evil is the lack of relationship between higher and lower between ontological, metaphysical levels in man and in society. This is the real meaning of the sin of avarice, and indeed of all the deadly sins. All the sins are so many aspects of pride or egoism, understood as submersion in the illusion of self-power, from instrument to idol. All the more was money itself a danger. As an instrument for broadening the passage of material help between human beings and therefore the range of human love, it was an inspired invention. But as the modern world had discovered about all ingenious inventions, it was a sword with two edges. All by itself as a thing, a substance, it was useless. It was meant only for helping people directly to live in the material world, while at the same time recognizing their dependence, first upon God and then upon each other. This is no doubt why when coinage was first invented, it was administered by the priestly class. As this is no doubt why, in many cases, the earliest coins bore a religious symbol on one side and a secular symbol on other, God and Caesar. Coins, money as thing, were intended as a tool, an instrument to facilitate necessary human interactions in the material world while helping man to remember his dependence on God and God's moral laws. The ethical laws governing money exchange connected this activity vertically to the divine commandments, and the nature of money payment in itself was testimony to the horizontal material dependence of human beings upon each other. The exchange of money could serve as a constant reminder of this mutual interdependence. In an economy based on need rather than desire, the bottom line is more than just an onerous limitation, it is an index for balancing one's own needs with those of others. When the desire for financial independence grows excessive, it may breed illusions of self-sufficiency and thereby fuel the error of egotistic pride. The spiritual meaning of independence was never intended to deny the individual's intrinsic obligation to the needs of his neighbor, nor the fact of his dependence upon his neighbor's work. Spiritually, independence means complete dependence upon God's truth and energy, acting from within the depths of one's own true self, and also freedom from slavery to humanly devised institutions and opinions. William Blake's 
mind-forged manacles. To deal in money in and of itself, with no immediate reference to goods and services, was to run a grave psycho-spiritual risk. Socially, such an activity cut the flow of human exchange by divorcing money transactions from the world of fundamental human needs. Psychologically, it tended to foster the illusion that security exists in what can be devised by the mind alone, the illusion that the physical world and the mind that deals with the physical world are the most essential aspect of human nature. The Christian teaching, like that of all the great traditions, pointed man to a reality behind the world of sensory experience as regards both his view of himself and his view of the cosmos. To deal in money, money as a thing, a substance, was to run the risk of believing in the ultimacy of money's power, thereby losing sight of the idea of the higher reality in the universe and the need to cultivate an openness toward it in oneself. Money cannot do what the true causal reality of nature can do. The true causal reality, the more fundamental causes of what exists and happens in the world and in oneself, medieval man calls this God. Do not take for God that which is not really God. This means, among many other ways of expressing it, not to look for power, safety, joy, service, love, or meaning from any other source than that which actually brings these about in the whole of reality. Do not take effects for causes. Do not take something that is an effect of the causal power for the causal power itself. This is the sin of idolatry. Pausing now for a moment in the flow of our historical, philosophical discussion about the origin of money in our society, surely we are bound to ask, as the serious Christian must have asked in the Middle Ages, what is God for me? What takes the place of God for me? What do I, what do we consider the cause of things that happen in and around us? And if our answer to this question is anything other than money, upon what is our answer based? If our answer is anything other than causes exist only in the material world outside myself, and inside myself causes only exist in my animal instincts and egoistic impulses, if that is not our answer, upon what is our conviction based? Have we really experienced metaphysical, invisible causes operating in the world? That is, have we really experienced God acting in the world? Have we really seen the great mind and purpose of nature? In oneself or in any human being or in any human event, have we really experienced causes, motivations, other than in the realm of the desire for sex, food, vanity, fear? That is, have we really seen the higher nature of man, either in ourselves or in others? At the heart of the great wisdom teachings of the world, including Christianity, is the view that really to experience the higher divine nature of reality in oneself and in the world requires an intense and carefully guided way of life and practice. This higher reality, the real causal force in the world, God, exists and is a force of ultimate and unfathomable power. But we are blind to its reality. And to open our eyes to it requires a great work. Those who claim to know it and who believe in it are often only dreaming or else are making far too much of a passing personal glimpse of something in here or out there of a different quality. Thus, each in its way, the great teachings have always warned us against false religions, shallow philosophies, and pseudo-spiritualities. At the same time, human beings must be given indications of the higher reality in the form of ideas, symbols, 
rituals, customs, images. There must be authentic religion, authentic ethics, authentic philosophy that can point man to the truth beyond what is experienced in one's ordinary state of consciousness. These indications are intended to evoke what, in the history of our civilization, has been given the name faith. Authentic faith is indispensable, and the support for the arising and maintaining of faith must be very strong, because the fact of the matter is that an honest man or woman, looking at his life and the life around him, is in his or her natural condition of mind bound to conclude that only material causes exist, that there is no higher reality. That is how the world and how the self appears to natural man living in the lower nature alone, the man of the senses. This, in brief, is why there was such a thing as dogma, in the positive sense of the word, namely, a teaching, a worldview, a system of ethical rules and principles, customs, symbols, and images that could call men and women to that which they would never be able to experience in their everyday state of consciousness. It is a narrow prejudice of our own era that so many view dogma with complete disdain. At the heart of the Christian tradition, the teachers and priests were not all rigid, naive, power-hungry fools, as has sometimes been believed by modern people. At the same time, things did go wrong. Something happened in the wide administration of the church that turned the whole effort of transmitting higher values in the direction of failure and disaster. It's important to bear in mind this deep context in which the making of money, especially loaning at interest, was viewed with such distrust. The making of money, the accumulation of material goods, draws man to trust too much in the lower nature for his well-being. It draws us to give it first place. At the same time, the lower nature has a place and a very strong place. The need for material well-being arises out of the transitory but real lower nature of man. And in so, the challenge of human life is that of rendering unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, no more and no less, and unto God that which is of God, no more and no less. The challenge is to live a two-natured life according to the unique ontological structure of the human creature, the flight from human nature. The monasteries decayed, the Christian life decayed, and human life in all societies decays. Whenever these two aspects of our being drift too far apart, this drifting apart takes many forms, and in the history of Christianity, it began on a world scale. It is always happening in the individual and always having to be struggled against. With the flight from the decadence of Roman society in the first centuries after Christ, in these first centuries, many ardent individuals fled to the deserts of Egypt to escape from the horrors of Roman materialism and sensual excess. Many of these ardent early Christians sought to experience God under conditions of isolation, not only from a decadent civilization, but from all other human beings. They tried to develop themselves in isolation as hermits, but... The most intelligent and serious among them soon saw that it was impossible for men and women to perfect themselves in this way. The social aspect of the self was needed. Isolated interiority could not develop normally without a relationship to the part of the self that is meant to exchange with other human beings. A sort of inner violence and spiritual egoism was developing as an overwhelming obstacle to true individual self-perfecting. Spiritual communities were established, the beginning of what became the Christian monasteries. The wise leaders of these early monasteries, such as St. Benedict in the 6th century, established forms of organization which dynamically changed over the centuries, in which the necessary confrontation between the two natures of man could take place. Association with others was necessary. Physical work was necessary, up to a point. 
and carefully monitored by the practical wisdom of the abbot or guide. By the late Middle Ages, the drifting apart of the two aspects of human nature was again taking place on a very broad scale in the monasteries. Again, the monastery tended to become an escape from everyday life, that is, an escape from the lower human nature, cut off from the authentic awareness of the animal and social impulses in himself. The religious aspirant fears these aspects, fears the outer world. The lower nature itself begins to be regarded as evil. The body begins to be regarded as evil. Normal human interactions begins to be regarded as evil. But these aspects do not die or recede. Their energy cannot be destroyed, but instead, without a presiding intelligence which they can voluntarily obey, their energy operates in disguise and wildly. While condemning lust, for example, an individual may simply lust after God. Lust is one of the names for the process of being devoured by emotional or instinctual drives, and an individual can lose himself in God just as fully as he can lose himself in sex. Avarice is the process of being devoured by material needs and desires, and an individual can be just as avaricious about salvation as about wealth or money. To condemn either sex or money as such is only to deceive oneself, the real enemy, is the tendency of the human psyche to be devoured by whatever impulse. The all-consuming flames of hell exist in our own nature. The well-documented degeneration of the monasteries in the late Middle Ages and the equally well-documented corruptions in the medieval church can be understood against this background of ideas about human nature. As the device called money took greater and greater place in the society of the Middle Ages, it became one of the chief objects of distrust, along with an often exaggerated condemnation of dealing in money and commerce. Mistakenly condemning the lower nature, religious practitioners were all the more subject to its force in their own lives. This state of affairs is at the root of what we call hypocrisy. The coin of greatest value. Money and the meaning of life. Those are not the eyes of a certified public accountant. That soft, forgiving blue is meant to reflect the summer sky or a clear mountain pool, not endless columns of numbers on tax forms. How and why did this gentle woman sitting in the front row ever become a CPA? The class is called Money and the Meaning of Life a one-day workshop that I am offering through the University of California Extension program. About 80 people have come, and from a surprising spectrum of backgrounds, lawyers, financial planners, owners of small businesses, as well as a number of students of philosophy and religion. But none draws my attention more than this blue-eyed woman with the face of a poet. From the moment she identified herself as an accountant, I found myself addressing most of my remarks to her. How old is she? Thirty-five? Fifty? Impossible to say. Crow's feet surround her eyes and mouth. Her dress is neat, simple, and youthful. She moves like a young girl, but her hands are rough and wrinkled. When she smiles, she's like a child. Instinctively, I feel she holds some kind of key to the question I need to explore in this workshop. I began by surveying the historical background of the money problem in modern times, and after sketching the medieval background, I outlined the brilliant theory of the early 20th century sociologist Max Weber about the origins of capitalism. Although Weber's theories had formed an essential part of my education when I was in college and were still an important part of the contemporary academic milieu, I suspected that these people had no knowledge of Weber, apart from a few of his phrases like Protestant work ethic and charisma, that have become household words. They were probably unaware that Weber, in his field and in, in his influence on modern thought, was more or less on a par with Freud and Einstein. Capitalism and religion. It was Protestantism, said Weber, 
that was the chief cause of capitalism. Astonishing. Freud shocked the world by arguing that a thwarted sexual drive was at the root of culture. Einstein shocked the world by showing that there were no absolute physical realities in the universe. But no less startling and no less revolutionary was Weber's thesis that it was a form of Christianity itself that had bred the worldly materialism of the modern era. According to Weber, the corruption of monasticism and other corresponding developments within the Catholic Church broke down the otherworldly ideals of the Church in the minds of many serious thinkers. The way was open to seek salvation in the very midst of worldly life. Through the teachings of John Calvin, and in the whole vast context of the Protestant Reformation that was moving through Europe, the goal of salvation was now intimately related to action in the world, not in a monastery. And now the world was the city in the beginning of its modern form, the city in which now all the gold and silver of the new world, all the forces of the scientific industrial revolution, material wealth, goods, inventions, were gathering. It was in the cities, Amsterdam, London, Venice, that processes of material exchange began developing to accommodate the new wealth, the new powers of technology. That is to say, the new instruments of dealing with the outer world of nature and society. Within this crucible of forces, there emerged many innovations in the sphere of financial exchange, innovations which we now recognize as the origins of modern banking including the widespread use of paper money and promissory notes representing money. The whole meaning and function of credit was undergoing transformation. A loan was made not merely to answer need in times of hardship, but to satisfy desires. It was an instrument to help in the functioning of business in general, and money was no longer a thing, valuable in itself or at least substantially physical. Money was a promise a representation, almost a thought. Money itself became a loan, a promissory note, while the thing it represented was elsewhere. Money became one step more removed from reality, whatever reality was. And what reality was became ever more a question. Because money became a representation of a representation, this is the meaning of credit in our world. It was able to move more freely, more freely because more on the surface of life. From being a great ship following the ocean currents, money became a light vessel responsive to the swifter moving flows closer to the surface. Material life skimmed more quickly and more efficiently. Money and wealth became more and more something in movement. Ah, but what kind of movement? We shall always have to ask this kind of question as we consider the inventions of modernity. For example, the printed word, the telephone, the computer. There is more communication by far now in the world among peoples, more quickly, over greater distances. But what kind of communication, at what level of life? Protestantism, in its Calvinistic mode, sanctified life in the world of the city, the world of business. The term used by Max Weber was worldly asceticism. The very qualities of self-discipline and self-denial that once characterized the monk seeking salvation under the special conditions of the monastery were now to be pursued outside the monastery in the conditions of worldly life. The circumstances in which one found oneself were to be regarded as one's calling the station in one's life in which one could and must serve God. It was neither necessary nor efficacious to seek specially protected or favored conditions in which to work for God. All human life, all of civilization, all the world was the creation of the all-powerful God, and therefore, strictly speaking, the world was man's monastery. Is there a way in life? I began the second part of the morning by remarking to the class about the historical hiddenness of the way in life. Fortunately, I had brought along my usual load of books and could hunt out references to illustrate my points. Throughout history, I began, the idea of the way in life has been spoken as of the path of the warrior, 
or as the teaching for kings. Both the warrior and the king represented in literal fact and symbolically the individual engaged in all the forces of life, as opposed to the priestly class or the ascetic removed or protected from many of the influences that permeate the greater world. Often this idea of the way in life was transmitted as the way of the magician, that is, in the language of sorcery. Again, it is a matter of the individual who confronts and masters all the forces, high and low, that constitute reality. These symbolic languages, represented by the images of the warrior, the king, the magician, have become distorted, and the form this distortion has taken is a fascination with powers and pleasures of an egoistic mind. And so the religion of the larger culture acts to turn the masses of people away from these symbols, with good reason. The broader religion, that which shapes the mores and ethics of a whole culture, insists on turning people's minds solely toward God and away from the ego. The first necessity always and everywhere in man's search for a rightly oriented life is to recognize the existence of a greatness, whether it is a being, God, a force, the absolute, or a truth, the Buddhist doctrine of non-ego. Until this turning is reached, until this attitude gels within man's psyche, the way of the warrior, the king, or the sorcerer is fraught with peril. But for those who have assimilated this attitude or who are gifted with an intense hunger for the transcendent, the way in life becomes an especially effective and intense path toward regeneration and inner development. Thus, no one can be a warrior unless he is first obedient, obedient to the higher Plato's warrior caste, the medieval Templars, etc., no one can rule as a king unless he is under the rule of God, the divine king, under the tutelage of the great priests, as in ancient Egypt, for example. No one can become a magician unless called to it by God, as was Moses, and we shall soon see Solomon. I paused in my lecturing. Some illustrations were in order. Arjuna the warrior. The Bhagavad Gita, for example, is the most widely revered single text in India, the whole vast ocean of Hinduism is summarized and epitomized in this dialogue between God and man. Written some 2,500 years ago and inserted in the middle of the great Indian epic, the Mahabharata, what is this epic? It is nothing less than a mythic representation of the war between the two cosmic forces as they confront each other in man, symbolized by two great families of royal, intermixed blood, king against king, brother against brother, army against army, a war of long duration filled with flowing blood, tears, deception, naivete, courage, foolishness, sacrifice, and sorrow on an immense canvas. And where does the dialogue between man and God, Krishna, take place? On the field of battle itself, as the armies mass for combat on either side. Who is man in this dialogue? He is Arjuna, the noblest warrior of all, the most feared and strongest. But Arjuna does not want to fight. I owe veneration to my teachers, he tells Krishna, and to my uncle and king. The enemy king is blind Dhritarashtra, symbolic of that inner false king, the ego. Arjuna asks, how can I take bow against these fathers and sons, wives, brothers, teachers, and other kinsmen marshaled against us? I do not want such a war, nor such a victory. When Arjuna, the great warrior, has thus unburdened his heart, he says simply, I will not fight, and then falls silent. Krishna smiles and speaks to Arjuna. 
There, between the two armies, between the two cosmic forces, Arjuna is given the teaching of the way in life. Take up thy bow and fight, says Krishna. Prepare for war with peace in thy soul. Plunge into the battlefield of life and make your inner world the true battlefield. Act, live as you are ordained to live, amid all the forces that every man and woman must face. Set your heart on inner freedom, on opening to the absolute, and fight. Act, move, lead, but search always for inner freedom from the very impulses and forces that cause you to act. Separate the inner awareness from the everyday self. Discriminate the eternal from the transitory in yourself. First, separate, and then embrace these two great levels. Be a warrior. Says Krishna, one man in a million is called to this path. And of those who are called to it, one man in a million follows it to the end. That is to say, to the very end of this path. The way remains always and everywhere hidden, difficult, and infinitely subtle. Yet, it is the greatest and highest path a human being can take. I took a breath and reached for another book, Solomon the Wise. I began as follows. Unique among all the legendary figures of our culture, Solomon represents the blending in one individual of godliness and worldliness. Here, a great double symbol rises before us, the king and the magician. Now, almost every ancient spiritual teaching in history speaks to us of the divine king. It is a universal symbol of the challenge before every man or woman to live simultaneously in the two worlds, the inner world of the spirit and the outer world of matter. Even Plato, whom many regard as the father of scientific rationalism, made this symbol central to his teachings in the image of the philosopher king. Ah, but King Solomon, he was also a magician. He understood about demons. Many a saintly man has been portrayed to us as a destroyer of demons, and that is certainly a high attainment. But the figure of Solomon offers an even greater possibility. Through the power of his magic ring, Solomon does not kill the demons, but makes them into his servants. As one legend has it, Solomon outwitted the demons even after his death, which occurred, according to this legend, while he was leaning on his staff supervising the labors of the demons on some sacred edifice. In that posture, so the story goes, his body remained a full year after his death, and only when a worm gnawed away at the end of his staff, causing his body to fall, did the demons discover he was no longer there. The figure of Solomon in lore and legend, as well as much of what is attributed to Solomon in the Bible, comprise one of those two traces strewn throughout the history of civilizations that indicate an art and even a science of living, one that shows us how to open fully to the forces of outer life while at the same time experiencing within ourselves the all-penetrating energy that sustains the universe. Over the centuries, these indications are covered over like signposts in a windy desert. Again and again, they have to be unearthed. You may read the Bible a hundred times without noticing these signposts. You can read about Solomon, for example, and not see that he is waiting there to counsel you in the very midst of your present life with all its contradictions, anxieties, and tensions. The Old Testament, like many ancient documents, can therefore be viewed as a sacred battlefield where life-giving new ideas once fought with old, entrenched attitudes about the conduct of human life. Always and everywhere, the old fights against the new, striving to dampen the real meaning of the human adventure. Safety wars against risk. Piety wars against the inner search. Moralism wars against conscience. Traditionalism wars against spiritual existentialism, the dream of happiness. Look, for example, at what the legendary figure of King Solomon is trying to tell us about the dream of happiness. In fact, these are passages that are well known to many of us, but what do they really mean? What profit hath man of all his labor 
wherein he laboreth under the sun. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. I said in my heart, Come now, I will try thee with mirth and enjoy pleasure, and behold, this was also vanity. I searched in my heart how to pamper my flesh with wine, and my heart conducting itself with wisdom, how yet to lay hold on folly till I might see which it was best for the sons of man that they should do under the heaven the few days of their life. King Solomon tries everything, experiences everything, but, be it noted, without allowing himself inwardly to be swallowed by what he does, his heart, that is, his inner self, conducting itself with wisdom, he tastes the whole range of human experience in order to understand the real sense and aim of his life. I made me great works, I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and perks, I acquired men servants and maid servants, and I had servants born in my house. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings, and whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them, I withheld not my heart from any joy. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. What lesson is being offered here? Is it only a sanctimonious injunction against the striving after material goods? That is how it often is taken, and even those who compiled the Bible seem sometimes to have changed or added words in order to deliver that point of view. But... If we tear away that veil, we see rather clearly the image of a man engaging in the fullness of life, studying, questioning, observing. For King Solomon, human life, with all its desires, dreams, and fears, becomes an arena in which we can experience the play of universal forces in ourselves. And it is this engagement, this study, which can bring what we seek. The things that we desire, material objects, physical and psychological pleasures, do not bring happiness. Solomon exposes that illusion to us. It is a striving after wind, but the study of life frees us from the dream. Freedom is the study of slavery. Happiness is the study of sorrow and false pleasure. This is a revolutionary attitude toward life. Everything else under the sun is vanity. Solomon's wish. money can and cannot buy. From the legends. The response will come from the legends. It is there that the grace notes of the biblical tales are often found. Those all-important grace notes that can evoke in modern people the feelings so needed to help us hear the hidden teachings of our Western scriptures. It is in the legends of Solomon that we may see how Solomon struggled between the darkness and the light. The Bible seems to tell only what God gave him and what God took away. It does not dwell on how Solomon earned his understanding, for the understanding that man is made for can never just be given, or rather it can be given only to the individual who is able to receive it. The legends of Solomon tell us of the struggle needed if we are able to receive the gift that is offered to us as human beings. And with whom or with what did Solomon struggle? None other than the king of the demons himself, the redoubtable ruler of this lower world, Asmodeus. The building of the temple. The tale begins with Solomon building the great temple that God had ordained him to build, but he cannot break the stones, for he is forbidden by Mosaic law to use metal to cut the stones of the temple. To build this great structure, he cannot use what comes from lower down in the scheme of things, iron. He gathers together his elders to receive their counsel, and they tell him that there is somewhere in this world a wondrous creature named 
the Shamir, a creature whom God created at twilight on the eve of the first Sabbath, among the very last of his wonders. Smaller than a grain of barley, the Shamir has such power that with the merest touch it can cleave rocks and cut through the hardest of stones. Command that the Shamir be brought, the elders say. Where can he be found? We do not know answered the elders. Summon the demons and inquire of them. The king brought all his demons before him. Where is the Shamir? he asked them. These were the demons who served Solomon, whom Solomon had mastered, the dark forces and men that the great king had seen and overcome. We too do not know where the Shamir is to be found, the demons answer, but perhaps Asmodeus our king will know. Asmodeus the king of the demons the one demon that Solomon had not yet conquered. Powerful as he was, Solomon had not mastered nor even seen the chief demon within, the source of all the dark forces within oneself. Until a man has struggled with this demon, he cannot take the place prepared for him from above. But where is Asmodeus to be found? asks Solomon. Where can I find the central demon of my life, the dark source of all that takes man, myself, away from consciousness? To this question the demons reply, Asmodeus dwells upon one of the great mountains in the land of darkness. Money and the Emotions As I was telling this story, I was struck by the way the class was changing. Some were utterly wrapped with the tale, but most were getting restless and looking uncomfortable. I hadn't really gotten to the main ideas of the story, the truths about ourselves, which indeed can make any of us feel uncomfortable. Were some of the students already sensing the subtle ideas behind this legend? Or was it only that I had gone past the time for the lunch break? I laughed to myself, announced the break, and went toward Elisa, who was coming toward me. She explained that when she had some years before decided to become a CPA, she had assumed it would only be a matter of arithmetic, mathematics, rules, and regulations. She had coldly and calmly chosen that, because after years of fighting a losing battle as an artist, she had no choice but to make herself marketable. She had assumed her work would be more or less mechanical from that point on, and she would do it until she had saved enough money to go off somewhere and return to her art. But I had no idea of the people element in this profession. I'm not dealing with forms and figures. I'm dealing with people. I'm dealing with lives, I'm dealing with hearts, maybe even with souls. I knew exactly what she meant. Time was in our society when it was the clergyman, the physician, or the psychiatrist who was most privy to people's secret lives. Their fears, desires, anxieties, their shame and misdeeds, their private sorrows, all their psychic beauties. But now, this role was occupied more and more by the accountant and tax preparer. In many cases, it is the accountant or tax preparer or estate planner before whose eyes and ears an individual spills the details of his life, wittingly or unwittingly. But, I said, that is exactly what people need now. Maybe it's even a whole new profession or role in our society. The priest accountant, the therapist accountant. We both smiled, and we were both serious. That's exactly what I've been pushed into, she said, and I don't know how to deal with it. When I see someone's financial records or lack of them, I'm seeing more about them than I want to see. I'm seeing their lies, their contradictions, their hypocrisies, their sexual hang-ups, their hatreds and pettiness, their phenomenal cruelties, and their incredible wishful thinking. As we were leaving together by the faculty exit, I heard my name called. I turned around. One of the students was hurrying toward me. May I have a word with you? I stopped in the doorway. Is it possible to get my money back? He asked in a voice crackling with tension. He was a tall, youngish-looking man, not more than thirty, with short, dark hair and a neatly trimmed, full mustache. He was wearing a maroon school tie and a tweed sport coat. This is not the course that was advertised in the catalog. Straining at the edges of courtesy, he reached into his folder and brought out the extension catalog. This man is a lawyer, I thought to myself. He began reading, Topics to be treated will include How much money is enough? Money and sex? How can you tell if you're selling out? What money can and cannot buy? The meaning of luck. I stopped him. He had a point. 
I offered to buy him lunch. His eyes lit up and all anger passed away from his face. I had wanted to use the lunch to talk more with Elisa, to understand something about her relationship to money. Why not use this young man to help me? As we crossed the street to the restaurant, I couldn't help noticing how affable this young man had now become. The demand to have his money refunded had been mainly an expression of an emotion, and my asking him to lunch had completely changed his emotional state. How far, I wondered, has money become an instrument of emotional expression in our lonely society? A language of the emotions, the only such language left for many of us. What a strange and strangely unexpected thing. Without anyone noticing it or naming it properly, this ingenious instrument of material exchange, money, has turned into the only means or the principal means of human communication in a society that has lost the meaning of so many of its laws and customs of mutual relationship. I filed that thought away for future consideration. We entered the restaurant, a marginally upscale sushi bar, crowded with the students from my class. As we waited to be seated, I took stock of how things stood with the course. As often happens to me, I had opened up more lines of thought than I could possibly pursue in the time remaining that afternoon. First of all, there was the whole Max Weber issue, extremely important. I had promised the class I would indicate what this great sociologist had left out in his epic-making analysis of the relationship between Protestantism and capitalism, and how this missing element could point the way to the possibility of the inner search right in the heart of the world of money, the world of today and tomorrow. I was referring to the historical emergence, starting in the 14th century, of a group of men and women who were practicing the way in life right within the bosom of Christianity. What we know as Protestantism was a reflection of this way in life, but a reflection that left out a most essential aspect of it. I had no choice but then to bring forward the whole idea of the way in life, an idea that goes back to the deep source of all wisdom teachings in the history of mankind. So I was obliged to speak to the class explicitly of this immense idea and to communicate something of its true immensity to prevent its being taken as a merely interesting psychological theory or even worse, as some new piece of overcooked meat in the New Age stew. I'd had to draw on mythic language that could be felt but not easily intellectualized. And so... I went to the legends of King Solomon with the idea of man's two natures so central to the teaching of the way in life is communicated with equal measures of dramatic power and symbolic subtlety. And that in turn meant explaining the real meaning of the devil, the chief of demons, as Modius himself in Solomon's and man's struggle for an enduring contact with the God within oneself. And now on top of all this, A student, this now amiable young lawyer, insists that I actually speak about the topics mentioned in the catalog description of the course, and he is perfectly justified. His name was William Cordell III, a name perfumed with money and destiny. But he was not at home, inside his name or his body or his probable destiny. Please call me Bill, he insisted, nervously smiling and fidgeting. Why didn't he just introduce himself as Bill? Even before the menus were brought, he was at me. At the same time, I was fascinated by him. I had never before seen a man whose life and character were so easily visible in his face. His posture, his name. This was a man who had too much money. That was exactly his question. As Elisa and I exchanged glances, he launched into the following. Please forgive my rudeness a moment ago, he began. But when I saw the description of your workshop, it really raised my hopes especially the question of what money can and cannot buy. Only five years ago, he continued, it seemed to me I understood something about that question. I was in my second year at law school, looking forward to a happy future. I had good friends. I was interested in helping people in the field of civil rights law. My parents were very wealthy, but never overindulged me. They provided for me very well, but I always understood that I had to earn my way in life. I knew I would take a position in my father's big law firm sooner or later, but I felt free to follow my own star. Almost overnight, all that changed. My mother and father died in an automobile accident, and as I was their only child, the entire family fortune fell into my hands. 
For a long time I was numb with grief, but eventually I was able to take an interest in my situation. When I registered how much money I had inherited, the shock was nearly as great as when I heard about my parents' accident. How much was it? asked Elisa. Sixty-five million dollars, said Bill in a strangely flat voice. I gasped, but I did not take my eyes off Elisa. Her eyes nearly narrowed in an expression of intense interest, like a scientist coming upon an unusual phenomenon of nature. Bill continued. I had already taken a leave of absence from law school, and when I applied for an extension of the leave, the chancellor of the school himself came to me to offer me whatever help I needed. What kindness, I thought, that's... That's such an important person would be so solicitous to an obscure student like me. But soon I began to realize how nice everyone had been to me. People I had not seen for years, or did not even know particularly well, came calling. Or wrote to me. I'm not stupid. I saw what was happening. Yet I couldn't help myself from believing they were all sincere. It was pure self-deception. But I couldn't help myself. But the most difficult thing was the way my closest friends started to behave. Every single one of them came to me for money, and always as though they were doing me some kind of favor, or as though I was morally obliged to share my wealth with them. I would have been glad to give them money, but they didn't allow me the chance. They didn't let me give out my own heart. As Bill was speaking, I noticed that the students at the nearby tables had grown silent, the ears cocked to hear our conversation. The waitress took our order. Bill went on. I became more and more lonely. I gave them money, and then long periods would pass when I wouldn't give anyone anything. I had financial managers, but I began to distrust them also. I bought everything I'd ever dreamt of, and when that paled, I bought things I didn't even want. I bought a horse ranch. I bought a big boat. I gave money to causes and charities. I bought a small publishing business. I bought a mansion. "'You were trying to throw your money away?' asked Elisa. "'No,' said Bill, after a long pause. "'No, I don't think so. "'In any case, that's not what happened. "'The more I spent, the more kept coming back. "'And at the end of a year, I had more than I started with. "'It's not easy to piss away sixty-five million dollars, "'short of just burning it. "'Well, how much are you worth now?' asked Elisa. While the waitress placed the delicate food on our table, Bill stared at Elisa with slitted eyes. Why do you want to know? Why are you so interested in the exact amount of money I have? Oh, here was the other Bill, or should I say William Cordell III. This was getting interesting. Elisa was unfazed. Her blue eyes sparkled, her lips curved in a smile. Because, she said, when it comes to money, precision is essential. If you don't know exactly how much money you have, you will never be in charge of your life, or that part of your life where money is necessary. Bill turned his face away from her in disgust. He looked at me and sadly shook his head, as if what Elisa had said was just another sign that the world was against him. Where had I seen that kind of look, that particular brand of self-pity before? that particular mixture of weakness of will and a sort of attractive innocence, a sort of beauty almost, but a rotting beauty. My God, it was the face of Paul Meyer, my childhood friend sitting sadly with his wondrous room full of electric trains. Fascinating, but there was more than that going on. I had seen that face in other people as well, people who were not rich at all, it was coming to me slowly. It was the face of a man compelled to hide from his own inter-contradictions, who had found the means to escape from every prompting of conscience except for one piercing, agonizing cry from somewhere far back in his mind, a man who had to prove the world was against him, even to the point of killing himself if necessary. It was the face of a man who could not even see even for a moment his own contradictions, who needed pity in order to prove. To prove what? A man who heard the call of conscience for a terrifying split second, and who had at all costs to close it down. But wait, isn't this the meaning of all our sorrow in this life? 
that one thing in each of us that blocks us utterly from seeing the main and central contradiction of ourselves? Isn't this, after all, the meaning of our impoverished soul? Isn't this the chief of the demons? It was now quite clear to me what Bill looked like. There are certain alcoholics. We have all known them. We have, Most of us suffered from them and loved them. Many of us are them. We have a certain compelling beauty, charm, creativity that compels us to love them or care for them, but who at the same time are deeply and irrevocably frightened, weak, childishly incapable of seeing or listening either to another or to themselves in the midst of the difficulties and responsibilities that life brings to all of us. That, after all, is the spiritual definition of neurosis, the constitutional inability to see oneself. Spiritually posited, neurosis has nothing to do with how one behaves or suffers. It has nothing to do with the fact that the psyche is infused with contradictions. It is primarily the failure of the capacity to attend to the truth about oneself, whatever it may be, with an awareness free of emotionalism, a capacity, by the way, which the great spiritual masters of early Christianity and Sufism called sobriety. Thus a man at one level can seem to the world to be an alcoholic by the amount he drinks and the way he behaves, but, spiritually speaking, within the most authentic realms of his psyche, he could be utterly sober and responsible to the power of self-attention within him, while another man may drink very little or not drink at all, and may seem reasonable and responsible, yet within himself he may be a roaring alcoholic, only not necessarily with the chemical substance alcohol as his drug. Bill's drug was money. He was like a man who had been given whiskey or cocaine without being prepared for its effects on him, or like a man whose body was genetically vulnerable to a certain substance, or like the young people of the 60s many of whom were raised with a conventionally moral but rigid upbringing and threw it all off under the power of drugs, half-truths, and an unusually hypocritical, stupid, and brutal war. Like marijuana in the unprepared person, like alcohol, sudden wealth had blunted and even reversed the development of will in the psyche of William Cordell III. He turned to his wealth to escape the inner contradictions that all human life is heir to, while at the same time his money allowed impulses to flourish and be implemented that would otherwise never have come to the surface. It was all in his face. For Bill, money was an instrument of the emotions, those emotions that obstruct our vision of the real world. But for Elisa, as I now began to grasp, money meant something entirely different. For her, money was an instrument of the mind. Questions. I had asked for carefully thought out questions, but I received something quite different. What came back were cries in the night, questions that have haunted mankind since the beginning of time. In another era or in another culture, these questions would have been asked in different terms, with reference to death, maybe, or pain, or the suffering of innocence, or the betrayal of trust that these questions now found expression in terms of the problem of money proved to me that I had been right to focus on this issue that is usually considered tangential to the concerns of academic philosophy. Here are some of these questions, exactly as they were written. How much of myself will I have to sell for money in order to be able to live more fully later? And can I regain what I've sold? 
And there is something very frightening about money. I don't understand it. So apparently it is not only a material entity, but is tied to inner psychological forces. What can I do to see clearly what money really means? Why am I so angry that the distribution of wealth is so polarized? Why does it make me feel so exposed, so helpless? Why do jobs that seem to contribute most to people seem to pay the least? Must one choose between material well-being and service to humanity? How can I maintain access to the spiritual in myself while living a life of relative affluence and awful money tensions that leave me feeling at times dead and at times in doleful exile from myself? How can we reach our own economic and emotional potential without basing it on the destruction of another's? How can I justify wanting and having money when people are starving? How can I let go of my fears about money? It totally absorbs my consciousness. I fear I will get old and become a street person. I work for a non-profit agency and interact with the poorest of the poor as well as the very rich. I want to help things be more equal without anger at the rich or pity for the poor or guilt toward myself. I want to feel I deserve to make money, not feel guilty about earning money. I want to keep a balance between the self-respect that money brings me and the search to know who I really am, my inner self. How can I prevent my sense of self-worth from being so dependent on how much money I make. What is money a substitute for in my essential nature? Why do I attach myself to it as something necessary to my life? What do I confuse it with? Why do I want more when I have enough? Why should I feel guilty about having money? Unless I've given, what right have I to receive? Isn't money a social product? If that social product is not distributed fairly, not really parceled out according to work done, isn't all money a representation of suffering? Filthy in that sense? Is there really something as real as money but not materialistic in human life? My moral and spiritual ideals seem pale and weak whenever I have to deal with money matters. Please prove to me that the world of ideas is as strong as the bottom line. Why does spending money cause me so much pain? The human potential movement is fostering the concept of right livelihood, or do what you love, the money will follow. My experience is that when I follow my greatest passions, art, music, theater, philosophy. I barely make enough to pay the rent. When I cater to other people's needs for what to me is meaningless, boring production, then I earn a living. My question is, is it only the lucky few in our society who can earn a living doing what is meaningful? Can we change this? How? Money seems like an objective reality, one that can be reasoned about in the form of numbers. But I become painfully confused when I encounter the emotional component of it. It seems to erode away all its apparent objectivity. Is money real, like stones and trees? If not, why does money seem so real? Why does money seem so real? The story of money, like the myth of the Holy Grail, is a tale of the corruption of ancient ideals of virtue by slowly corroding evil. The first form of money was shared food, which for many centuries preceded the evolution of coinage. Coinage had the same significance as the grail, that of a sacred relic, symbolizing a holy meal among a loyal fellowship. Money in our culture originated in an identical manner as the Holy Grail in a ritual communion meal in which the shared food symbolized mutual dedication among the communicants. 
our money began as a religious symbol. Insofar as man's ethical ideals are concerned, and however barbaric and cruel the reality may have been, economic relations in ancient times were to some extent conceived of as religious relations. In this lofty sense, despite the slavery, oppression, and warfare, money symbolized the loving, giving, and taking among individuals, which gave men the feeling of having emotional roots in their community. The community was a religious congregation, and all members felt themselves to be fellows in a sacred communion. Money originated as a symbol of man's soul, the meaning of materialism. Since the beginning of recorded history, man has been haunted by the intimation that he lives in a world of mere appearances. In every teaching and spiritual philosophy of the past, we find the idea that whatever happens to us, for good or ill, is brought about by deeper forces behind the world that seem so real to us. We are further told that this real world is not accessible to the senses nor understandable by the ordinary mind. But, and this is a point that is not usually understood, we live in a world of inner appearances as well. We are not what we perceive ourselves to be. There is another identity, our real self, hidden behind the self that we believe ourselves to be. It is only through awakening to this deeper self within that we can penetrate behind the veil of appearances and make contact with a truer world outside of ourselves. It is because we live on the surface of ourselves that we live on the surface of the greater world never participating, except in rare moments, which do not last and which are not understood, in the wholeness of reality. It is this all-important second aspect of the ancient wisdom, the aspect that speaks of our inner world, that modern thought has been blind to. And the question about the meaning of life is inextricably linked to the need for contact with the real self, beneath the surface of our everyday thoughts, emotions, and sensations. Without this contact, the external world of appearances assumes for us the proportions of an overwhelmingly compelling force. We cannot see the real world because we are not in contact with the deeper powers of thought and sensing within ourselves that could perceive it. Because of this, it is inevitable that we experience the external world as the strongest force in our lives. This is the meaning and the origin of materialism. The error, or to use a Christian language, the sin of materialism, has at its root nothing to do with greed or possessiveness, nor does it involve at its root some philosophical view about matter and spirit and their usual meanings. No, the error of materialism is an error of reality perception based on lack of experiential contact with the inner world. What we know as greed and possessiveness, with their attendant traits of cruelty and human exploitation, are results of this ignorance of the inner world. We turn to the superficially perceived outer world for that which can only be obtained through deep access to the inner self. Materialism is not a sin. It is a mistake but a mistake of immense proportions and with deadly consequences. It is like searching for water on the surface of the moon to search for meaning in the external world, like grasping a picture of food and trying to eat it, not only meaning but also health. Safety, service, love, and power can be obtained only through turning to reality. The unreal world can never yield these things to man. Facing the Contradiction In every human life there are glimpses of the inner world, glimpses that could lead us to the search for the real inner self. They may be only um, 
elementary experiences and they may be isolated, random and fleeting, but they certainly exist. What is not understood about them, however, and what is not experienced, that is to say, not willingly nor consciously suffered, is the contradiction, the opposition between the inner movement toward the deep self and the outer movement toward the external world that is given by the senses and organized by the logical mind. Something analogous to the experience of this contradiction is in fact familiar to all of us. We approach this whenever we realize that how we act contradicts what we feel to be our deepest values. But we do not accept these experiences as the gateway to consciousness of our true nature. Our morality compels us to deny them, to cover them over with justification or promises to do better next time. Yet it is just these experiences of the disparity between our values and our behavior which could be felt as vividly as anything the external world has to offer. If we would seek a reality stronger than money, we may find an opening in the cultivation of a new attitude toward these common experiences of inner contradiction. The ancient rites and customs provided the basis of experiences of the inner world, sometimes very deep experiences, while satisfying the needs of the outer world, the external life and physically perceived nature in human society. But the contradictoriness of the two worlds, the spiritual world and the external world, was generally taught only by the hidden path. The mode of living in two opposing worlds and relating consciously to both of them has always been difficult to discover. Just as in our own life it is something that will have to be rediscovered again and again against great odds, the intensity of money. Now, returning to the question of why money seems so real, the conditions of life in our culture do not support inner experiences, experiences of movement toward a higher part of oneself that are as vivid as experiences of the outer world and the part of oneself that is drawn to the outer world. And as money has become the principal means for organizing contact with the outer world, there is nothing more vivid for most of us than the question of how to have, get, make, accumulate money. No fear greater for many of us than the fear of not having money. It is therefore not a question of getting rid of these desires or fears. What do most of us have to put in their place? Nothing that is as vivid, except perhaps in physical pain or in front of death. Otherwise, there is nothing in most of our lives as enduringly intense as the money question. Therefore, nothing seems as real. The money question is so strong, not because money is ultimately real, but because our experiences with it have become, for most of us, the most vivid and intense experiences of our lives. There are many concepts, ideas, habits, conditionings from ideas received in childhood that support this fundamental illusion about money, but the main and basic point has to do with the intensity of experience. Therefore, the way to struggle with the tyranny of money's seemingly ultimate reality is, first of all, to search for a quality of inner experience that is at least as vivid as, as intense as our concerns about money. This is not easy or obvious. It's impossible to achieve by turning to religious ideas or to love or to art or the pursuit of knowledge. And the reason this cannot be done in these ways is that all these activities have already been absorbed by the money problem. And this is the real crime of our culture. Not that we are selling God or truth or morality, at least not as that accusation is usually meant. The crime is that the buying and selling are more intense and inwardly vivid than anything else. But we must not forget that the main reason we have bought and sold God, truth and morality, is that the forms we have used to relate to these ideals no longer offer us the direct experiences of them that are possible and necessary for man. If a person marries for money rather than love or duty, it is not necessarily because he prefers money to love or duty, but because he has not experienced the real force of love or duty. It is as simple and as profound as that. Love and duty as examples of facets of the inner world cannot be 
truly experienced unless we can contact both currents of energy within ourselves. There is no love in the outer world alone, at least not for human beings. There is no duty in the outer world alone. There is, nor is there beauty, nor creativity, nor understanding, nor anything else we consider authentically human. The outer world alone, the world under the sun, is, as Solomon tells us, vanity, vanity. Authentic human existence requires the co-presence of two worlds, the inner and the outer. To exist in one world alone is not to exist at all. And this is Sheol, hell, death, the disappearance of the soul, its ultimate impoverishment. And what has become of money itself reflects the fact that it, like our lives, has become reduced to an instrument functioning in the outer world alone, Intended originally as a device to help man live in two opposing worlds, money has become only a technology to organize our lives in hell. The outer world cannot give meaning to a being made to live in both the inner world and the outer world simultaneously. We are living in an outer world that pretends to be the inner world. The elements of human life that are primarily rooted in interiority, service to the higher, that is the realm of relationships of love, knowledge, creativity, elements that are reflected in family, community, the refinement and perfection of nature, science and art, all these elements are now embedded in money. Money seems the most real factor of life because our glimpses of the inner world are immediately swallowed by modes of acting and thinking and feeling that are geared to dealing with money. We will never be free of the money demon through what we now call love, ethics, or science and art. The modes of modern comportment in these realms have been altered to become solely part of the deceiving outer world. Why is man on earth? Consider these lines, dark, rich, and luminous, written by Rainer Maria Rilke, perhaps the greatest poet of the 20th century. Why, if this interval of being can be spent serenely in the form of a laurel, slightly darker than all other green, with tiny waves on the edges of every leaf, like the smile of a breeze, why then have to be human? Why are we here? Why is man on earth? The poem continues. Oh, not because happiness exists. That too hasty prophet snatched from approaching loss. Not out of curiosity. Not as practice for the heart, which would exist in the laurel too. Rilke is one of those authentic poets in whose work language recreates itself in the midst of the language we already have, the language of men and women who do not sense and feel what is at the heart of reality. The poet, the artist, always strives for a new language in the midst of hell, a language that emanates from a consciousness of hell, the world of meaningless gain and loss, the world we live in. The poem continues. But because truly being here is so much, because everything here apparently needs us, this fleeting world, which in some strange way keeps calling to us, us, the most fleeting of all, once for each thing, just once, no more, and we too, just once, and never again. But to have been this once completely, even if only once, to have been at one with the earth, seems beyond undoing. This is not the language of escape. 
The poet opens to another world and finds that in that other world he is more fully and consciously in this world. The poem continues, And so we keep pressing on, trying to achieve it, trying to hold it firmly in our simple hands, in our overcrowded gaze, in our speechless heart, trying to become it. Whom can we give it to? We would hold on to it all, forever. What can we give? What are we meant to give? Now consider the heart of the poem. For when the traveler returns from the mountain slopes into the valley, he brings not a handful of earth, unsayable to others, but instead some word he has gained, some pure word, the yellow and blue gentian. Perhaps we are here in order to say house, bridge, fountain, gate, pitcher, fruit tree, window at most, column, tower, but to say them you must understand, oh, to say them more intensely than the things themselves ever dreamed of existing. Isn't the secret intent of this taciturn earth when it forces lovers together that inside their boundless emotion all things may shudder with joy? For the poet, what the lovers are given and what they give represents the most intense passion of the human heart and mind. But it is not neurotic intensity. It is not the intensity of ego. It is the intensity of love, the intensity of giving rather than doing, of receiving rather than taking. There is something that only man can give. What is that? The poet answers, consciousness. Consciousness that is suffused with feeling and sensing of this world in all its variety and particularity. Praise this world to the angel, not the unsayable one. You can't impress him with glorious emotion in the universe where he feels more powerfully. You are a novice. So, show him. Something simple, which formed over generations, lives as our own, near our hand and within our gaze. Tell him of things he will stand astonished as you stood by the rope-maker in Rome or the potter along the Nile. Show him how happy a thing can be, how innocent and ours, how even lamenting grief purely decides to take form, serves as a thing, or dies into a thing. Things, the poet tells us, are not only external objects, but all that is and takes form within ourselves, our own inner things, our own inner earth. This earth, this world, is all our thoughts and feelings and sensations, all our impulses to act and move. It is this world which we are meant to see and love with the impartial passion that knows each thing, as Adam named the creatures under God's gift to him. Under the radiance of this power of man, all inner and outer things take their unique and proper place, none stealing or gaining from the other. It is in the inner world that one must overcome the principle of gain, of ego, Fallen man is not an ego, but a thousand egos. In fallen man, each function and part seeks to take more than what it needs. And these things, which live by perishing, know you are praising them, transient. They look to us for deliverance, us, the most transient of all. They want us to change them, utterly, in our invisible heart, within, oh, endlessly within us. Whoever we may be at last. Earth, isn't this what you want? To arise within us invisible? Isn't it your dream to be wholly invisible someday? Oh, earth invisible. What, if not transformation, is your urgent command? What I have tried to do in this book is to call for the inclusion of the money problem in the search for a consciously regenerate life. This means to include in our search all that we usually judge as evil, selfish, violent, and harsh. The other world, the higher world, is, as Rilke tells us, this world consciously experienced. The following is a gist of a conversation I had with a businessman. Tell me, I asked him, you yourself have been in business all your life. What's your secret? I don't mean the secret of making a lot of money. 
how have you managed to make being in business something that's really what you call interesting? What does it mean to you when you say that making money is interesting? I'm sure you mean more than piling up material things or having people envy you. He reached on his desk for a book. I was a little surprised to see that it was one of the new translations of the poems of, of Jalaluddin Rumi, perhaps the greatest of the mystic poets of Islam. He leafed through the slender volume and handed it to me, opened to a poem which the translator had entitled, Why Organize a Universe This Way? Read this, he said. I took the book and read aloud. What does not exist looks so handsome? What does exist? Where is it? An ocean is hidden. All we see is foam, shapes of dust, spinning, tall as minarets. But I want wind. Dust can rise up without wind, I know. But can't I understand this? By some way other than induction? Invisible ocean, wind, visible foam and dust. This is speech. Why can't we hear thought? These eyes were born asleep. Why organize a universe this way? With a merchant close by, a magician measures out 500 L's of linen moonlight. It takes all his money, but the merchant buys the lot. Suddenly there's no linen, and of course there's no money which was his life spent wrongly, and yours. Say, save me, thou one, from witches who tie knots and blow on them. They're tying them again. Prayers are not enough. You must do something. Three companions for you. Number one, what you own. He won't even leave the house for some danger you might be in. He stays inside. Number two, your good friend. He at least comes to the funeral. He stands and talks at the gravesite. No further. The third companion, what you do, your work, goes down into death to be there with you, to help. Take deep refuge with that companion beforehand. Taking in this beautiful poem, I immediately sensed why he had asked me to read it, but I wanted to hear him say it. Very well, I said, the only reality is work, but this kind of work is not what people usually mean. What has this got to do with working to make money? He handed me another roomy volume and said again, Read this. Again, I opened the book and read aloud. A friend remarks to the prophet, Why is it I get screwed in business deals? It's like a spell. I become distracted by business talk and make wrong decisions. Muhammad replies, Stipulate with every transaction that you need three days to make sure. Deliberation is one of the qualities of God. Throw a dog a bit of something. He sniffs to see if he wants it. Be that careful. Sniff with your wisdom nose. Get clear, then decide. The universe came into being gradually over six days. God could have just commanded. Be. Little by little, a person reaches 40 and 50 and 60 and feels more complete. God could have thrown full-blown prophets flying through the cosmos in an instant. Jesus said one word and a dead man sat up, but creation usually unfolds like calm breakers. Constant, slow movement teaches us to keep working like a small creek that stays clear, that doesn't stagnate, but finds a way through numerous details deliberately. Deliberation is born of joy, like a bird from an egg. Birds don't resemble eggs. Think how different the hatching out is. A white leathery snake egg, a sparrow's egg, a quince seed, an apple seed. Very different things look similar at one stage. These leaves, our bodily personalities seem identical, but the globe of soul fruit we make, each is elaborately unique. If this book has succeeded in opening the meaning of what is being spoken about here, then it will have accomplished its purpose. The aim was nothing more nor less than to sacralize the money question. 
This does not mean making money itself sacred. It means finding the precise place of money at the heart of the most important undertaking of our lives, the search to become what we are meant to be in the service of that greatness that calls to every man or woman on this endangered earth.